The UFC and MMA as a whole has come quite a long way since its days as a fringe, no holds barred, VCR bargain bin extravaganza. But in 2023, given where the promotion is now placed, relative to other major sporting bodies, for this video I wanted to take a look at a few select things that I believe would improve the UFC and I guess the sport as a whole. So here are some changes to the UFC and to mixed martial arts that would likely result in some massive improvements. Abolishing the 10 point must scoring system. As things stand, and it's actually baffling how many MMA fans are totally clueless when it comes to the scoring of fights, and this actually extends to the commentators and even some of the fighters. And sure, that's because the scoring systems are pretty complex, and it does seem like a majority of people aren't exactly sure of how they work. But the main point is the current system feels kind of counterintuitive to what makes sense for an MMA fight to be scored by. Under the current rules, if Fighter A puts on a total masterclass in rounds one and two, looking amazing and basically doing everything just up to the point of getting a 10-8. He doesn't quite make the 10-8, but it's a pair of massive statement rounds that definitively go his way. And then Fighter B wins rounds 3, 4, and 5 by incredibly narrow margins through a string of very boring, low output exchanges that could have gone the other way. He wins that fight 48-47. But in your mind as a spectator, you remember the bigger moments, not the overall scoring round by round. All of a sudden, a legitimate win by the scoring criteria becomes a quote-unquote robbery, even though it technically wasn't. At this stage we need a scoring system that allows for more room beyond a simple 10-9 or 10-8 because we barely see 10-7s. The pride system of judging fights on their entirety is also clearly a superior system in my opinion but to be honest I think the solution here will need to take elements from an overall fight scoring approach instead of round by round and combine it with a more thorough and nuanced criteria and even if they do decide to go the route of round by round scoring let's just get beyond this whole 10-9 thing. Not all good rounds are created equal, but for now, a toss-up, a narrowly won round, a comfortable round, a dominant round, and basically anything that's not a 10-8 is scored the exact same, and it makes no sense. I will point out that I don't like open scoring. Fighters will sometimes counter this by saying, well you do know the scores in an NBA game, so why can't it be the same here? Well, NBA games can't abruptly end the second someone goes unconscious, and at this stage I think the unknowns in the scoring are just part of the allure, part of the combat sport experience. Tighter weight cutting regulations. Look, this next one is also quite obvious. And while there are many solutions as far as doing weigh-ins differently, all I can say for sure is that the current system is catered way too heavily for people who make huge weight cuts. Remember before how the ceremonial weigh-ins used to be the actual weigh-ins, before the UFC opted to push back the rehydration window by a few more hours so their fighters would have more time to rehydrate. Well, that just allowed certain fighters more time to undergo even heavier weight cuts. So now we have two weigh-ins, the real one and the show one. In an ideal world, fighters would just compete at their natural weight. There would be some form of weigh-in done on fight night with a reasonable allowance given. Say for example, if it was a lightweight contest, you'd probably see a hell of a lot more fighters weighing in at say 152, 153, just so they can confidently make the fight without breaching the upper bound limit of their division. The idea being that they fight at their natural weight, removing this excess tactic of trying to gain every pound of advantage possible. It just muddies the waters and makes it about more than the actual competition inside the cage, which let's be real, should be front and center. Two man commentary booth. If you've been watching this channel for a while you certainly knew this one was coming. I like a lot of the UFC commentators as individual pieces of the puzzle and overall I think the promotion has one of the greatest voices in sports today period in John Anik steering the ship but too often a lot of the issues that pop up event to event are caused when Joe Rogan and Daniel Cormier get a little too giddy or when Dominic Cruz or Michael Bisping start talking trash and don't get me wrong sometimes this is fun but a lot of the tangents these guys go off on and more often than not it's the timing of these tangents it just gets in the way of the actual commentary. And it's all well and good for seasoned fans who don't need their hands held when it comes to gaining insight into what's happening before your eyes. But sometimes I just find that the two color commentators will take up to a minute of a round talking about a past fight or even something totally unrelated to fighting, like what Daniel Cormier had for breakfast, because he's a big dude, Joe, instead of focusing on what's happening inside the cage. And I do think that Joe Rogan has lost a step or two over the years. Event by event, I find myself frustrated 
it a lot of the time, usually on the prelims, because of the lack of interest or intensity, and you know, that can be tough to keep up, but my main problem is when they go off topic, and Anik generally has to reel them in. And I know you've probably all experienced this as well, to varying degrees. I just think some of these pairings don't work. Maybe I'm being harsh on the idea of a three-man booth, but overall, like I said, I do find that John Anik is great when it comes to steering things back on course whenever they get off topic, but generally, all of these commentators are far better when their role is more clearly defined in relation to the play-by-play -play guy. It just gets a bit messy otherwise. Officiating improvements. Okay, so I don't have a concrete answer for this one, and I would like to specifically turn this one over to you guys to see if you can come up with a solution in the comment section. All I know for sure is that certain situations in the cage should not rest solely on the shoulders of the single referee in question. I may be wrong, but as things stand, I believe that the fight is over as soon as the referee makes the decision to consult the replay footage. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but while I don't want the ability to challenge plays or VAR in football, you know, like the video referee that just ruins the flow of a game, something that just wouldn't work in fighting. But in situations where fouls have happened that mess with the fight's result, or even prior to disqualifications, I think there are resources there that we can lean on, especially in 2023. Also, another point I wanted to make here, as far as officiating goes, is the kind of laughable grey areas that exist when it comes to fouling your opponent. As things stand, due to the very silly warning system that's in effect, and this ties into the scoring system as well, you can basically get yourself one free foul before the referee even considers taking a point. That means you can hit them low, you can stick a finger in their eye, you can try grabbing the cage if the referee doesn't see it, and yeah, I know it's a fight, and if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, but it just seems a little bit all over the place as things stand. And going back to our original point about the 10-point must system, perhaps a new scoring criteria can make room for more potential punishments that come between the effect of basically doing nothing at all with a warning and taking away a whole round's worth of work. Miscellaneous issues with fighter pay, uniform deals, and Dana White being Dana White. This one covers a wide range of topics, and to try and boil each section down with suggestions that would solve each problem would probably take several videos. The issue with the UFC at present goes far beyond their revenue share, the shafting of the athletes through their freedom to wear their own shorts, the measly payouts from the Reebok and later Venom deals. These are all of course symptoms of a company that is run in such a way that has been proven time and time again to be highly aggressive, totally self-serving, and while yes, the obvious counter to all of this, like it was plucked straight from the pages of Dana White's playbook, is to say that the UFC has become one of the biggest sporting companies in the world, and that MMA as we know it owes its current success to the work of the people behind the UFC. And look, they're not wrong, but that doesn't mean that their practices, their modern practices, get a free pass. It doesn't mean that Dana White should be given free reign to act as an even bigger personality within the sport than any of his fighters. And I love Dana, it's hard not to, but he plays this sport like a game, manipulating the fans and their narratives, intimidating the media in a way that seems archaic in comparison to other major sports, putting a stop to any real journalistic attempts through a culture of fear, but more importantly, he uses this dominance to keep the fighters down, and he's so damn good at what he does that he can make hundreds of thousands of people simply forget just how inherently serious this sport is, how insulting it is to expect fighters to be pressured into low paying contracts or less than ideal fighting opportunities because of this culture he has created around the UFC. Yes, MMA is miles ahead of boxing when it comes to making fights happen, but how many times at this stage have we heard Dana White bending the truth at his fighter's expense? You know the whole, I guess some guys just don't want to fight, we can't make them fight, as he speaks about maybe the hardest puncher in the world in Francis Ngannou. It's silly, but it works. And Dana's politician-esque level of spin mastery at the head of the ship has allowed him to run this company and and through that the sport, in a way that is detrimental to those competing in it. And yeah, the UFC is a powerful company for a reason, one that was admirably built up from next to nothing, only to grow into one of the biggest promotions in sport, period. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that for as much as I can't help but love and admire Dana as a part of the sport, and as much as I understand that he is most certainly not the one making all of the decisions, with him acting as a face for the company, albeit one with real power, I do wonder how this sport would change if he stepped aside, or when he steps aside if the UFC were to change their practice, you know, if they offered a little help to their athletes post-retirement, gave them back the life-changing freedom to once again pursue sponsorship deals for their shorts, maybe if they didn't, you know, immediately antagonize anyone who said no to a fight offer in the media. And while we're at it, I'd also be interested to know what the sport would look like if the UFC weren't so damn good at scaring the media shitless. Anyway, this has kind of devolved into a little rant. We all know that there are many problems 
performance in this sport. But hey, we still love it. And that'll just about do it for this video. So what do you think of the points I raised? And in your opinion, what rule changes or entire overhauls do you think would make the UFC and MMA on whole a better place for both fans and fighters alike? And if you do want to help in supporting the channel, liking the video and subscribing would do wonders. Thank you for watching.